Father, we thank you so much once more for this opportunity to just stop the busyness of life, just reflect on your creation and uh, the history of your people. And Father, we understand that whenever different people get into the room from different cultures and different backgrounds, they may disagree about this or that. And it's precisely within the context of people disagreeing that you revealed your word, your story, and that you chose these people of Israel through whom to reveal your history, and their history continues. And so, Father, our, our um, reflection on their life, their corporate life, is for us to learn um, what you have to teach us. It is so that we understand uh, the spiritual heritage from which we come. It is to understand the world in which we live so that conversations that we have with one another can be informed, that it be free from bias, free from um, slander, free from hatred, um, free from phobia, and rather just honest dialogue about truth and what is revealed and what you would have us to know. And so, Father, we just ask that your spirit would go before us and clarify the thoughts, clarify the words, uh, help us to see your truth through your creation. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, so we are in week four of our study on Judaism. We have rifled uh, at rocket speed through the first 1,700 years. And so now we are find ourselves poised at around the year 1,700. And I had hoped in this talk today to kind of get us up to the present, but I kind of ran out of room. So we never, I didn't quite make it all the way in this talk through up to the present. Uh, I got up around World War I and I ran out of room. So we're going to have to stop somewhere around World War I. I'll come back next week and catch us up from then to the present and also maybe look at some other uh, issues that come up with regard to Judaism. So if you remember where we left off last week, we were talking about the fact that uh, this Jewish population now was spread throughout what we know as the Western world, all the way through Western Europe, Eastern Europe, Northern Europe, Northern Africa, Arabia, just scattered throughout. And in these civilizations, what we find is a great deal of anti-Semitism beginning to happen. Uh, but just horribly um, suppressive, um, discriminatory practices out of, unfortunately, Christian regimes and sometimes Islamic regimes. And so Judaism was seeking to make some sort of uh, reality, some sort of community, some sort of sense out of living in these harsh environments. And we found out that they were very uh, adept at this. And notwithstanding all the persecution and all the hardship, carved out for themselves a very significant role in not only faith, but in economics and in politics and all the rest. But now, as we come to the year 1700, we merge into a kind of a new period where there is a light beginning to dawn. We call it, in fact, in the Western world, the Enlightenment. And so how is Judaism going to respond in the environment of Enlightenment? Now, before we kind of get entirely into that end of the pond, I do want to talk about another movement here called Hasidism, the Hasid community. Uh, that kind of arises about this point in history. Then we're going to look at this movement called the Haskalah, which deals with Judaism in the time of the Enlightenment. Then we'll look at the different forms of Judaism, their response to modernity, how is how are we going to be Jewish and still be fully participant in the modern world? And lastly, we'll look at this topic called Zionism. So we'll see how far we get. I'm, uh, as always, optimistic that we'll go farther than I think we will, but we'll give it a shot. And we're going to start with this rise of Hasidism. And you remember we um, talked about the fact last week that while much of the Western European community was being very oppressive, expelling Jews from their homelands and kicking them out of their various places, the area of Russia and Eastern Europe was inviting them in. They were in a period of transition there, and they needed 
folks with their mercantile abilities, with their leadership abilities to come help and manage their lands. And so there was a great influx into the areas that we now know as, as Poland and Ukraine and Russia. And so uh, there is a large Jewish community just blossoming there, but it's a tense community. It's a tense community because on the one hand, you have the land rulers that were living mostly in the Lithuanian area, owning the land and seeing to these Jewish folks to kind of be land managers for them. And it placed the Jewish folks kind of in between the landowners and the populace. And so this tension began to arise between the landowners, the rich and the poor, shock, shock, right? Always that tension. So in, in, you, in Eastern Europe, you have this tension between the rich landowners, the peasants working the ground, and the Jewish folks that were managing were right stuck in the middle. And pressure was coming. And whenever you get in that pressure situation, you're sometimes forced to side with one side or the other. And so what happens in that intense cauldron of back and forth is you actually get a couple different strands of Judaism, one that tends to align itself more with the hierarchy and one that tends to align itself more with the peasantry. And that's really what you have in this case of Hasidism. You have a, a, a kind of a earthy level kind of faith revivalistic kind of enterprise. Uh, Hasidism started as a revi revivalistic uh, movement. It was the idea to bring spirit, to bring heart, to bring emotion, to bring uh, belief and passion and, and real experience back to the Jewish experience. So it wasn't so much a matter of law and learning as much as it was an experience of passion and belief and living it out and joy and so forth. And so uh, that's really what we have here. So if we, we want to look for a little bit at this movement called Hasidism uh, and see how it makes its way from Europe into America. Again, we're just going to be able to sketch this at a very high level. I wish we could spend more time. It's a fascinating study. Um, the founder or the um, most people assume the founder of the Hasidic movement is Baal Shem Tov, um, born right at the end of the 17th century, lasting into the 18th century here. Um, his name, Baal Shem, uh, Baal Shem Tov, means master of the good name. And uh, Baal Shem was a technical term that was used for many kind of practitioners that were um, in this area of Eastern Europe. These were folks that practiced among the people and in an era where medicine was not totally defined in classic modern terms, of course, you have kind of practitioners that would go among the people and they had this ability to apply healing and uh, apply medications and put together herbs and those kind of things and be able to use Jewish prayers and so forth to help bring healing. And so these um, these individuals became known as Baal Shem. They were keepers of the name, and they would go out and be practitioners among the people. Well, Tov means great, and so it turns out that Baal Shem, uh, this particular Baal Shem, Israel ben Eliezer, is his real name. That's his birth name. He's so very good at this art that he gets the nickname Tov, the great keeper of the name. So the master of the name. So that's where that comes from. Sometimes you'll hear the Besht is just an abbreviation of that Baal Shem Tov. He is the individual that's kind of seen as the leader. Uh, very, it's hard to know a lot about his history. It's enshrined in legend. He didn't write a lot much himself. I don't think we have anything left that he himself wrote a work. It's all recorded by those who came after him, a very non-assuming person, but the legends about him are large. It is said that uh, he, he just st stayed up night and memorized and memorized, but nobody knew how smart he was because he was an average worker, worked out in the fields. He started off as an assistant to a school teacher, helped in the synagogue and so forth. Uh, in fact, he was so non-assuming when he went to ask for his bride's hand in marriage, the father turned him down because he thought he didn't have any prospects. He was so uh, unappealing. 
unbeknownst to him, the guy was a genius, but he just kept his genius to himself, got married, worked in clay, worked as a merchant, a wagon driver, did all these kind of things. But uh, as he went along, he practiced this ministry of just helping people wherever he could, and he became good at this kind of folk medicine and helping people along. Well, apparently, as he's ministering and he's learning the Talmud and he's learning the wisdom and he's adding words of encouragement to his efforts of healing, he begins to develop a, a following. And this following begins to grow. And I should add, as part of this healing, that you remember we talked about early on this whole mystical side of Judaism called, uh, manifested in this group of works called the Kabbalah. Well, he, he was an expert at the Kabbalah too, had vast portions of its memorized, and so there was a mystical aspect to what he was doing as well. So he was such a, an effective minister that people began to follow him, and he began to kind of put together these groups of followers. And so after a while, it, become a, it became a very tense situation. People would come to him instead of the rabbi for direction. He became the expert. And so this kind of movement began to spread of these Belshems, these practitioners, that, these charismatic leaders among the people, that people would start to follow. And so over time, these kind of communities that he founded or that he kind of grew up around him, so to speak, began to multiply throughout this section. And if you see in the map that follows on the next page, by the time you get to the end of the 1700s, there's a dozen or more of these communities all over Eastern Europe. And those communities are called courts. And so you have all these courts scattered all over the place. And so this whole movement of revivalistic, homegrown, homespun Jewish practice grew up. Well, as this developed and expanded, the rabbis that were still in the Lithuanian area, they're looking at these movements and say, wait a minute, this isn't right. And, and so you have this group uh, called the Misnagdim. And they are the opponents. That's just what the word means, opponents. And they become concerned that these peasants are following these upstart leaders and not following the rabbinic leadership, not following the, uh, the, the legal aspects of Jewish law. And so there's this tension between the Gaon. Remember, we talked about the Geonim, the, the, the folks that were the head of the yeshivas that were really the courts of the day, and they were kind of the authorities in this section in the medieval world. Well, now there's this tension that grows up between the official rabbis and these new upstarts that are practicing these kind of folk uh, congregations where they are. And so we get to the place where the Gaon of Vilna actually excommunicates the Hasids from the faith, say you're not allowed to come to the tabernacles or come to the temples, you know, synagogues. You're not allowed here because you're not practicing orthodox thinking. And so there's this real uh, tension that goes on. And, of course, it creates even creates more tension with the four, poor folks that have been following these Hasids. And so the tension between the two grows and begins to split. Well, this tension continues to the point that sometimes the groups were telling the authorities one on the other, and it really looked like we are on the verge of breaking here. But something's going to happen later that's going to bring them back together, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Now, most of us, when we think about... Hasidism and Hasidic Jews, we think about New York, right? And uh, what you see in New York. So the question is, this is all going on in Eastern Europe. How does all this stuff get brought here to America and to New York City? Well, two of the key figures with regard to that are um, Schneerson and uh, Tietelbaum. These are the two folks that kind of bring this here. Both of them came to America in connection with the war. 
being driven from Eastern Europe in the context of Nazism and all the rest, they get, uh, they come here one degree, another. Tietelbaum, I think, was actually smuggled out in the midst of all this. And so they come to New York City and they began to set up Hasi communities here. Uh, Schneerson was uh, a very um, down-the-line kind of guy. And it's said that he came in the uh, the youth of America, the U young Jewish people saying, you have to bend with us, you have to adjust. And Schneerson would say, no, it's good for America too. You, you're going to do, the, the, the law is good for you too. So he was very strict about bringing people in, but he brings this whole Hasidic movement to New York City. And Schneerson, is, he's interesting. He passes away in 1950, and his son-in-law, he doesn't have a son, so his son-in-law becomes the new... Uh, Rebbe of, of this particular court. And when his son dies, I think it was in the early 90s, I want to say like 94 or something like that, um, there's no replacement. He doesn't have an heir. And these Rebbe's, they went by family pretty much. And it turns out there's no follower. So what you find there among some of the um, folks from this particular particular Hasidic court, they kind of saw this last Schneerson as maybe the Messiah coming back. And so some, a few of those still see uh, Schneerson's son-in-law coming back as a Messiah. So that's just one piece. Uh, Tito Baum, also very strict guy, very matter of fact. Uh, some sources even uh, see him as uh, just militant about uh, keeping things pure. It's said in the old country, I think this story is associated with him, that uh, the local town wanted to put a women's uh, kind of ritual bathing house too near the men's bathing house, and he tried to fight the city council on doing that. The city council wouldn't approve, so he just took a bunch of henchmen out in the middle of the night and ripped the construction sites down. That's how emphatic he was. Uh, he's very, very militant about keeping these things uh, separated. But this is kind of how the movement gets into America. So um, just brief historical statements, some faces to put with movements. But what is really Hasidism all about? Well, uh, you know, this is a very difficult question that scholars wrestle with all the time. Is it a separate Jewish movement? Is it a separate Jewish enclave? Or is it just a movement within the larger sphere of Orthodox Judaism. So there's a lot of tension, and when you try to even ask sometimes what are the distinguishing features of Hasidism, some scholars will say there are none, because everything in Hasidism is, comes from legitimate Jewish tradition or from the Kabbalah or from uh, the rabbinic sources. And so this is a tense question. But nonetheless, I thought for our purposes, I'd at least take a shot at it and try to help us to see maybe what some of the major features of the Hasidic tradition is all about. And the main, the main point, I think, that all Hasidism believes in is this centrality of the Rebbe, or what's called the Sadiq. Sadiq from it's the righteous one. The idea that somewhere there's this leader that you follow, this gifted leader. And some Hasid movements even see that gifted leader as somewhat the Messiah for here and now. In other words, not beyond his own time, but for the here and now. He is the sent one. He is the one that God is meant to lead that community. Now, there are many communities, or as they call them, courts, I, the last count I looked at said there was probably as many as like 60 courts in New York City as long, alone, uh, 12 major ones, living in three primary locations, mostly in Brooklyn, from what I understand. Uh, but So there are many courts and many of these rebbe's, but they, everything's based upon a rebbe or a sadiq. And the, the standard phrase or the customary statement is, without a rebbe, there is no hasid. So you're following somebody. They are the inspired one. And they are given this responsibility to care for their community, 
and it is kind of a closed community. They're responsible for making sure that everybody gets enough food and everybody gets enough housing. They're responsible. They become the arbiters in divorce cases or in other kinds of cases. I mean, it is a community, and they are the final um, arbiters of this. You come to them for advice. You come to them for decisions. Uh, there's usually um, a, a charity gift that you give when you come. Uh, once a year you meet and there's this dinner that you come and, and it's, there's a hierarchy as to who sits closest um, to the Rebbe. And so all this is kind of interesting, seeing as how Baal Shem Tov was supposedly one of the most humble guys on earth. He didn't want the position. And that's kind of the ideal, that's kind of the image, that these folks are supposed to be this humble servant of the people, there to help the people. Uh, along with this, there's an interesting idea that there's a prayer connection here that's supposed to happen with regard to this Rebbe. There's a sense in which you pray for him and he is meant to pray for you. So your prayers, in essence, go through him to, to God. And so there's this way in which he cares for you spiritually as well. He has this intercessory role. It's not like you pray to him but you pray for him and through him he has this intercessory role between you and God. So it's a very um, uh, interesting communal activity. And this role of Rebbe or Tzaddik is, is um, it's passed down from father to son. And if there's no son, it can be a son-in-law or a relative of some sort. And so you don't kind of earn your way into leadership. It is passed down to you. And very, very, at this point in history, it's not like a new guy starts up and starts his own um, clan. No, it has to be passed down to you. Now, what will sometimes happen is when it's passed down to the son, and maybe there are several sons, some, some of the sons will split off and start their own sub-branch uh, of a court. And so sometimes that occurs. But it is a, a handed down from generation to generation um, sort of thing. Another aspect, again, this is debated, but I think it's worth mentioning. There is, it comes right from Bel Shem Tov, this idea that God, it's an emphasis on God's omnipresence. God is in all things. God is here among us. And so everything about life takes on a sacred character. Everything you do takes on a sacred character. He's involved in all of work, in all of relationships. He's here all around us. And so Every detail of life takes on a sacred character, and I think that comes in some way out of the Torah, the idea that, uh, you know, you have to watch what kind of clothes you sew together and what kind of food you eat and how, all the cleanliness rituals you go through to make things happen. This is this idea that God's holiness is in all of, all of earth, and so that's carried out in uh, great detail in the Hasid community. There's also this emphasis on love. It's not just about orthodoxy. It's not about believing the right thing. There has to be an, an absolute love, a passion for prayer and for God. And so there's a very lively worship and prayer service that happens with Hasids. They move when they pray. Uh, when you see them, they'll move a great deal. Uh, that is their emotional response to God. This can be a passionate thing. It goes back to that revivalistic idea from Eastern Europe. And so there is this supposed to be this love for, I use the word Hashem. Remember we talked about Hashem is the name. It's the uh, colloquial name for God because you don't use the four-letter word we call Yahweh. You call Hashem. That's the name for God. And so there's a passionate love for Hashem. And this idea that there should be love among the Jewish people, and that is we're supposed to love one another. There was tension among the Jewish people, the divisions that came. And so the idea is that you're supposed to care for one another. This is a community, your brothers and sisters that are supposed to bind together. That's built in to the Hasidic experience. And then this idea of happiness. Joy is a high value in the Hasidic community. They love to celebrate. They love to dance. They love music. And so there's this, uh, these tales told that even in the ghettos, there's this ongoing celebration that goes on. Uh, 
And this idea that the Shabbat, the Sabbath, that is a time of rejoicing. I love that concept. That it's not a burden to do Shabbat. All of life is supposed to be centered on Shabbat or Sabbath. This idea that you stop and celebrate your, in the presence of God, that's part of the Hasidic tradition. And then what's interesting, there's kind of a general, and this isn't 100% true, but it, it's generally true that the Hasidic community kind of rejects this idea of Zionism. And we're going to talk about Zionism. I don't know if we'll make it to it in this class, but eventually we're going to get there. This belief and this commitment to the restoration of a political Israel. That the Hasids were very concerned. They're very strongly messianic. They believe that the Messiah will come and establish Israel when Israel's ready. And so there was this suspicion of Zionism, and we will see when we get there that a lot of the Zionistic push was secular in nature, that it was, it, it was coming from Jewish people that were not necessarily orthodox in their orientation. It was a political solution. It was an ethical or a political solution more than anything else, an economical solution. And so the Hasis were very suspicious of reforming a, a nation state just on political basis or cultural basis. They were waiting for spiritual restoration and waiting for a Messiah. And so they pushed pre pretty hard on the whole idea of political Zionism, as we're going to see illustrated. The other reality is this use of Yiddish. You probably have heard Yiddish spoken, this wonderful combination of uh, Hebrew, Slavic, Russian language that has a mixture of all written in Hebrew-like characters. Uh, that was their lingua franca. So we're, whether you're from Eastern Europe or from Brooklyn, you speak the same language, you speak Yiddish. And so um, that's, it's a lovely language. It's, I'll just let, turn it off there. If I had more time in my classes, I actually play some Yiddish. Uh, it's a beautiful language to listen to. So just, but in, in Hasi, that is the language you speak. And then, of course, what we're most used to is the distinctive dress and appearance. Uh, especially among the men, the beard, and depending upon which court you're with, you do different things with the beard. You either uh, trim it or curl it or you let it grow rough. The hair, the earlocks, they're either let grow rough or curled, again, depending on which court you're with. The hat that you wear of various shapes and size, different courts will wear different ideas. This idea of head covering, it's a large head covering. That goes back to the rabbinic days of you should wear a head covering when you pray, and Rabbi in the Talmud saying he never takes more than six steps without having his head covered. And so this is an, ex an extension of that desire to stay uh, holy before God and to understand your position before God to have your head covered. So uh, we're used to seeing that, that dress, that, that um, distinctive black conservative dress. And uh, again, that varies slightly from court to court but that would distinguish most Hasids. So we could go into a lot more depth with a lot of different information, but I thought it might be helpful for us to get a little bit of a background and a little bit of shape to what is this thing called Hasidism. It, it is tremendously um, enriching, great stories, uh, great music, just wonderful to, to study this culture. So Now, that is one response to the realities on the ground in Eastern Europe. Now we want to look at a different uh, response, and that is something called the rise of the Haskalah. Now, while all this tension was going on in Eastern Europe, Western Europe, all this anti-Semitism and discriminatory behavior, out of, out of this culture there emerges this thing called the Enlightenment and this recognition of new learning. It goes all the way back to the Renaissance where all of a sudden you're going back and you're looking at sources and there's this um, kind of freedom from tradition to go back and look at where you come from and, and freedom from religion almost that the, celebrate the human intelligence, the human intellect, philosophy, uh, the age of Darwin and, and Immanuel Kant and all these folks that are just uh, coming up with whole new layer of intellectual enterprise. And so 
the Haskalah was a group of Jewish folks that participated in the Enlightenment to one level or another. And along with this intellectual revolution, some things politically were changing in Europe in different, on different levels and in different ways, but there were these various legal acts called emancipation, this movement called emancipation, and in various places in Eastern Europe and in Germany and other places, law of France, there were laws being enacted to prohibit discrimination against Judaism at one level or another, not in a modern sense, not in an equality sense, but there were laws being enacted across Europe to start to relieve some of the legal pressures and some of the, uh, the dress code things that we saw and all these, these ghettoizations, there seemed to be these laws being passed that now gave Jewish people a little more freedom to participate in the life of the people. And so some Jewish folks, when this began to happen, the Enlightenment on the one hand, giving them this new intellectual stimulus, over here on the other side, that now there seems to be this freedom to act more economically and politically, you have a movement of Judaism that said, we need to embrace all this. We need to embrace our new culture. We need to reduce the tension between ourselves and those who oppress us. We need to become more like them. We need to speak their language. We need to read their literature. We need to engage in that kind of effort. And so that is really the Haskalah. It is a Jewish cultural movement from the early 19th century sought to embrace the new learning of the Enlightenment and new political opportunities in various areas. So it's this idea, sometimes it's called assimilation. I don't really like that word, but sometimes it's called assimilation. It's this idea that uh, let's minimize the distinctions between our Judaism and the surrounding culture. Let's accommodate or at least assimilate ourselves into the culture of the diaspora in which we live. All right? So there are a couple and I just put in there, if you hear the word maskalim, that's what the maskalim were. They were the followers uh, of this Haskalah movement. And there's a couple examples to that I put in here. I could put many more. This is just to give you a flavor of what some of these Haskalah folks were about. Um, Naftali uh, Vesely, Vesely, I've heard different pronunciations, or just Vesel. Sometimes his name is just pronounced Vesel. Um, from Germany, he has this, he writes this word called words of peace, or this treatise called words of peace and truth. And what he argues here is that there's really two laws. There's the law of man, the law of Adam, and there's the Torah. And they're really two different truths, a way of seeing truth. They're, they're reconcilable. You can find God through this Torah of man as well as the Torah of God. And it's incumbent upon every Jewish person to understand both Torahs, to, yes, understand the Torah of God, the Torah that's been passed down to us, but there's also the Torah of man, which is science and literature and history. You, you should learn those things, languages. Vesel uh, was a great person for language. He, this idea of uh, Hebrew, he was this revival of Hebrew, get back to the original languages, kind of reduce, kind of minimize the Yiddish. Let's speak uh, the classical Hebrew or, or the local language. Let's emphasize those. And so a very, very known for his uh, efforts in Hebrew, wrote commentary on Leviticus, I think, just, but a real expert in languages and emphasizing to the people it's time to step up and become one of the intellectually respected people in our culture. Let's blend in with them but let, and let's exceed them in knowledge of both the God's Torah and man's Torah. And this idea that let's return to the sources. This goes back to the Renaissance and beyond. Let, let's kind of get back to the, the Torah. Let's study the scriptures. They're Rather than the Talmud, Talmud's important, but let's, let's get back and emphasize the study of the scriptures because that's the source, that's the document, that's where it begins. And then, of course, probably the person called the father of the Haskalah, the, the one who we're probably most familiar with is um, a man by the name of Moses Mendelssohn. Mendelssohn was just a genius. There's no other way to put it. I mean, he, he was just... Uh, Amazing for his ability to retain and learn great passages, 
from memory. Um, he was not a healthy man through most of his life, and so he spent a lot of his life kind of battling illness as he's writing. But he becomes this bastion of intellectualism, and he develops all these relationships with non-Jewish people. And so he's, he's trying to build bridges with this Christian and uh, Islamic world. He's trying to build bridges between the religions with the secular world. He's trying to encourage Jewish people to uh, come into their own. Now, what's interesting is, is he himself was an observant Jewish person. I mean, he, he followed all the laws. He kept all the, um, the misvot. Uh, but what happened is he was arguing that you don't have to live this on the outside. You can, it's a private thing. You can keep it inside. Now, he would later very traditionally try to defend folks that have been accused and oppressed because of their Judaism, but he was very much trying to raise the respectability of Judaism among the eyes of the Christians and the fellows and the um, and the other fellow scholars. And he has this idea that there's that Judaism, the revelation of God, is entirely rational. You can think through this truth. You can. Um, learn this truth through reason. It's all in there. It's entirely rational. There's nothing irrational about what God reveals. And he spends a great deal of time arguing that everything about the Torah is a supreme example of reason. Uh, and he's very interested in making sure that the, to, to kind of help in that reconciliation between people, he's sensitive to the fact that people make a lot of allegations about the Torah and all that. And in order to help that reduce that tension, he actually renders the Torah into German. He's writing a German translation way before Luther, uh, or way after Luther comes along. He kind of redoes it for Jewish. In fact, he uses some of Luther's work. Let's render the Torah uh, back into uh, back into German, so that the people can read that centuries after uh, Luther does it for the Christians, the New Testament. And so he's trying to do that same kind of thing. Let's make the Bible available in German. And so that's part of what he's about. So tremendously important uh, person in the development of this Haskalah, the raising of the Jewish culture in Germany. Uh, another interesting person with regard to that is jo Joseph Pearl. Uh, he's now, he comes out of that area we now know as Ukraine. Um, He's an in interesting dude. I mean, he, he's writing his first books, publishing his first books by the time he's 13. Interesting. So I, I'm I trying to think what I did when I was 13, but I don't think I was publishing books. Uh, he, he was already publishing books in Hebrew and all the rest. And um, where he came out of a Hasidic background, but fairly early on, he rejected Hasidism. He realized that that was a voice, or he thought, he argued that that was a voice from the past. And so he's arguing, let's put Hasidism behind us. And so he writes these very sharply critical words about the Hasid faith. So now what begins to happen in Hasidism is the Hasids and the Misnuggan, the opponents, they're beginning to say, wait a minute, we have a bigger enemy here. We better learn to get along because these Haskalah are going to ruin Judaism. And in a strange sort of way, it's these Haskalah that begin to put Hasids and their opponents come together and they actually signed agreements to agree with one another and stop fighting so that they could join together and against this new modernism, this new liberalism that's creeping into Judaism that's going to erase the core and the traditions. And so Joseph Pearl had a lot to do with that. And I'll just add to um, Isaac Bear Levinson. He is another one of those folks that uh, he's kind of called the father of Russian Haskalah, and he does the same thing in Russia. Uh, he writes this um, very popular treatise called Warning to Israel. And in that, he's arguing that the Jewish people need to embrace their nationalities. 
They need to learn the local culture. They need to learn the the local language. They cannot keep themselves segregated forever. They need to go to public schools and and learn public languages. They need to learn local literature. They need to be a force in the community. The idea is one among equals among those. Stop always withdrawing yourself and being a separate community. Get engaged. And he further argues then that that is really what it means to be Jewish. In his mind, he, if you go back and look at Jewish tradition, he argues the whole point of Jewish tradition is to adapt to the circumstances. That, that has been the whole nature of Judaism from the very beginning, to adapt to the culture in which they live. They've lived in so many cultures, and so the essence of Judaism is the ability to adapt to the culture. And so these are just a few of the many thinkers that through the years had argued that this enlightenment and this new political opportunities, we need to kind of minimize the distinctions. It's in some ways similar to what happened here in you know, some of the more liberal Christian denominations, right? I mean, when the new learning comes in, the idea from a Christian, let's kind of minimize the distinctiveness and kind of unify, stop making us feel so different. It's this idea that we could reduce the oppression, reduce the critique, reduce the scandal if we just gave up on some of the things that were most divisive. And do we really need to have those? Can't we go back to our sources and figure out what's important, what's not, and kind of reduce the things that divide? And that's really the spirit, I think, between the Haskalah. Let's just realize what is that tradition that we've accepted and passed down from generation to generation that create that pain and aggravation to us? Can we just set it aside, scrape it off, and realize, get down to the essence? What's the real essence of Judaism? And can we live in that way and become full citizens in the culture in which we live? And so now you have these two tensions. As we emerge into the modern world, how are we going to be Jewish in this new culture? Are we going to go the way of the traditionalists reflected in the Hasid and others? Or are we going to accept this new direction of assimilation and being a part of the culture in which we live? And so what we have here in this early part of uh, the latest part of the 19th century into the 20th century, you have these movements emerge of Judaism that take different approaches to that problem. How do we fit into our current culture? How much do we give in? How much do we give up to be a part of that culture? And so from that, we end up with various forms of Judaism. And so we'll look at those revised forms of Judaism. And we'll look at kind of four levels, Reform Judaism, Conservative, Reconstructionist, and Orthodox. And just to give us a feel for what we're talking about, This is a little um, graph I found on the Internet to kind of tell us uh, how how this breakout happens. Again, it comes from the Pew Research Study from about 19, or I mean 2013, I think. And notice that the largest, and this is about American Jewish population, self-reporting, which which denomination, if you will, of Judaism are you a part of, uh, 35% says the reform, so the largest group. And we're going to talk about what each of these are as we go along. What's interests me is the second type of Judaism is no denomination, not affiliated. Uh, these are folks that we would say are culturally Jewish, but they're not really practicing Jewish. They're, they're, they're folks that know they're Jewish, but they're just not attached to any synagogue. They don't practice. They're just, uh, they're just uh, cultural Jewish folks. Then it's much smaller than you have conservative and then orthodox and other. There's some additional um, groups that we won't have a chance to get into in any detail. So we're going to walk through each of these types of Judaism and talk about maybe a little bit about how they got started and maybe what distinguishes them. Uh, Reform Judaism, we kind of began with a fellow. Most folks kind of land on this individual as the one who is the founder of Reform Judaism, Abraham Geiger. Uh, early 19th century. His, his point, similar to what we heard before, is that Judaism is always evolving. We have a responsibility to keep Judaism alive. We need to adapt to our culture. We need to read our culture, adapt to it, 
the secret of the strength of the Jewish tradition is its ability to adapt to the circumstances and adapt to the realities of the ground. And so a controversial figure bounced all over the place uh, from one place to another uh, where he finally was able to get a synagogue that would put him in charge. He introduced some really radical reforms. Uh, for example, the sermon. This was a new experience. What he's doing here is he's saying, let's make Jewish worship a lot like the Protestant churches around us. Uh, let's make the synagogue experience similar to the Protestant experience. Let's, let's have some similarities so we don't seem like all this is different. Now, in his view, that was a very Jewish thing to do. We're just adapting tradition to our culture. That's what Jews have done for thousands of years. And in the process of arguing that, he says we're adapting to a new world order. In this new world order, let's, let's give a sermon. Let's have it in the vernacular language so we can explain to people and teach people. So uh, that was his innovation. Uh, prayers, not just in, in Hebrew. The prayers need to be said in a common language. And again, I, as a church historian, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of Luther in all this, you know. He, he was the same idea. Let's, let's take the Eucharist out of the center and put the sermon. Let's build up the sermon. Make it more. Calvin, the same thing. Let's, let's build up the sermon. Uh, songs in the common language in German. I mean, that was Luther too. So there's a lot of that idea. Let's, let's make this amenable to the people. And it wasn't just to minimize the tensions with the people outside. He was dealing with the reality on the ground. Jewish people were now, they didn't speak Hebrew. They spoke German. They were people out there kind of dealing in the marketplace. And so how do you make the faith relevant to them? You don't speak in Hebrew anymore. You speak in German as much as you can to help them understand. Uh, Breaking down, there was always this idea that when you came to a synagogue, there was a women's area and a men's area. You always sat separately, where Geiger was the one to say, why are we doing that? Let's, nobody else in our culture does that. There's no warrant in his mind. We need to evolve. And so now there's this scandal of, of mixed seating. Some of the multi-week, multi-day um, observances of the Jewish calendar. Let's kind of get that in and out in one day. There's nothing sacred about having so many days that's there. And then, of course, the, the biggest shock of all, the guy brought an organ into the synagogue. Can you believe that? He brought an organ into the synagogue. You know, that was scandalous in its day. Now I get in trouble if you take the organ out of the worship service. But in that day, you brought an organ in. That was the scandal. And so it brings the organ and the cantor and a choir into the Jewish synagogue, that was, that was an innovation that got him into a lot of trouble because that just wasn't done in a Jewish synagogue. And so he introduced a lot of those innovations into the Reformed service. And if any of you have been to a Reformed Jewish service, you'll notice some similarities. It, it, it's, imper it's purposely set up to look much like the average service that was going on in Geiger's time. Um, so we actually do end up then very early on getting in Cezanne, Germany, you get your first um, reform synagogue. Uh, Geiger's hope was that this wouldn't become a separate type of Judaism, that it would just be blended into Judaism as a whole. But what became evident, you start making changes like that, and you're not going to be able to fit in. All right, so it became evident very early on, and even from, I mean, you can see Geiger's born by 1810, so even before he came on the scene, he was still hopeful that we could kind of blend this in, but even before he came on the scene, it became clear that you're going to have to have separate sanctuaries, separate synagogues that practice this way, and so this is the first one that I, that I know of on record from 1810, so even just the year of, of, of his birth, there's already at least one sanctuary there. If you want to look in America, believe it or not, uh, the first Reformed synagogue in America is, of all places, you would think of Brooklyn, right? But it's in Charleston, South Carolina, of the bastion of baptistry. Uh, it's down there in Charleston. Uh, it's 1841, and you can actually still go there. It has a new name, a new definition, and it's been rebuilt, obviously, but uh, that's the first 
Reformed synagogue you can see there in America. Uh, as far as how it gets to America, again, many names we could talk about. I picked one just so we had a clue. Um, he's kind of, um, Wise is the, the guy that kind of brings it in and really establishes it as a bona fide movement here in the United States. It's, again, uh, 1846, coming here, setting that up, uh, begins to establish in these reform movements right here in the U.S. In this case, it's in Albany, New York, where he sets up his first reform synagogue. He does the same kind of thing. I mean, he sets up pews, and they're family pews. Again, that mixed seating, families sit together. Uh, m much different than the Orthodox idea where you split between men and women. The whole family pews sit together. Remember, that's the way you did it when you're Protestant in that day. You rented your pew. You went to the Protestant church and you rented your pew. Uh, if you go down in Boston to the, the church, I forget the name of it, just off the top of my head there, in Beacon Square, or not in Beacon Square, in, in the old section where Paul Revere and all that, that church. You can go there and see the, the, the British Bay Colony's church, uh, pew there and they have it all decorated. You rented your pews as a family. Uh, we thought of doing that again in Bethany to raise revenue. We were going to do that again, but uh, the elders voted us down. But the idea was you rented your pew. And uh, so Wise takes that idea and just builds it in to the Reformed section that there's family pews, families sit together. Again, trying to make it look very similar to what the Protestant churches are doing. And not only do you have choirs, you have mixed choirs. Can you believe that? Men and women singing together. That was quite scandalous for its day. Introduced the kind of Jewish confirmation rite, very similar uh, to the, the Protestant or the Presbyterian and the Lutheran roots. And then he did this absolutely scandalous thing. Believe it or not, he started counting women's votes. Can you believe that? Counting women's votes. This was way out of kilter for that day. And uh, so when you... Minyan, when you come together to get the minyan so that the community can vote on something, he'd actually count women towards that quorum. Huge progressive state. Uh, he had the audacity to propose a new prayer book. I mean, to go through the traditional prayer book and actually write a new prayer book. It'd be equivalent of somebody saying, I want to write a new hymn book. Throw out the old hymns. We're going to arrange them differently, right? It's like when I went to church in the old days, we had this thing called the song sheet. And on Wednesday nights, occasionally we sang, from, or when we went to prayer meeting, we'd sing from the song sheet. And the senior citizens of the day, they didn't like the song sheet. They were, don't bring out the song sheet. We got to use the hymnal. So he actually changed all that. You know, he, 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 in the, on the reform side, he like totally wrote a new prayer book. And he had the audacity to believe that if all the reform synagogues used it together, they could unite. And it was quite a radical proposal for the time. Uh, Vice sometimes gets in trouble because his one critique, and I didn't put it on the slide here, I probably should have, he, he was very hesitant about the uh, slavery movement. He was very slow to condemn it, and he got some degree of criticism for it. Another reform uh, thinker, Einhorn, David Einhorn, I didn't, have, I didn't put him in here, but he was very critical about Wise as far as his unwillingness to move in that direction and to support uh, the abolition of slavery. So he does get some critique for that. But on the whole, trying to introduce a great deal of change here in Reform Judaism. I thought it might be interesting for you to see as well um, that they're actually very early on, the Reform Jewish movement was the first one to ordain women as early as 1935. So. Not right away. It took a little ways to get to the place where they're actually ordaining women. But uh, Regina Jones becomes um, one of the first ordained, or the first that I know about on record, ordained woman from the Re Reform Movement. Uh, she actually becomes uh, a minister there uh, in Auschwitz and other places to minister to others, and she actually ends up being executed there in Auschwitz. And the interesting thing about her is no one knew about her. I mean, she was buried in the history, and it's really only after the opening up of Eastern Europe 
and scholars have been able to get into some of these places and look at some of the archives that they discovered the story of Regina Jones and uh, this Kellenbach, Katrina uh, Kellenbach, 1991. So she was unknown, this woman rabbi, until 1991 where she was discovered in East Berlin and those archives were open. So interesting development. And so recently uh, they had this celebration. And what's interesting is uh, when they had that, the first when they had that celebration, the, remind, uh, uh, the memorial for this person, uh, Sally Priestland went there. Now, Sally Priestland, as far as we know, is the first recorded American woman to be ordained as a Jewish rabbi, not until 1972. So if Reformed Judaism goes all the way back to the early 1800s, it's 170 years, 72 years, before they're actually to the place where they're ordaining a woman rabbi. So... Sally Priestland is still there. She's still very much alive and still speaks from time to time. She's down in uh, Tinton Falls, New Jersey. Uh, or no, I think, yeah, I think she's retired in Tinton Falls, retired in 2006. So, um, and she has spoken around and you can, um, you can see that. And uh, uh, unlike Jones, who was kind of an emergency kind of ordination, it seems to be kind of like a chaplain, uh, Sally Priestland was fully ordained by the Hebrew Union College and had a synagogue and all the rest, so she was full-fledged. So what is it then that distinguished Reformed Judaism from the other pieces? Well, uh, this is one summary, and again, you, you kind of search in vain sometimes for this, this information. But this is as close to kind of the basic tenets. I took this from um, uh, one of the official documents. So the idea that uh, we do believe in God. So that's comforting to know, <laughs> right? Uh, they said, look, guys, we're, we are reformed, but we do still believe in God. We haven't left the faith. We still believe in God in some fortune. And um, It, in the Torah, though, I mean, it is written with human hands, so in a language of its time. So in other words, a document that can be studied. Now, it is still divinely inspired, whatever that means, and rabbis debate what that means. But it is a human document that can be studied as a human document. That is, you can look at it with languages and all the rest. A firm belief in the rationality of humanity that was coming out of the Haskalah movement, the idea that we had a brain, God gave us a brain, we can use that brain to figure things out. And so that leads to the next uh, tenet, the belief that the process of reinterpretation of the Torah to the language of it today is ongoing, and that every Jew has a stake and a role in that restatement and extension. In other words, there's a personal responsibility of engaging with the Torah and working that out for yourself about how you want to be engaged or how it's going to work out in your life. In other words, the principle of individual responsibility and individual conscience. And again, as a, as a student of the Reformation, I hear Luther in that, that idea that uh, the church doesn't tell you what to do, the magisterium doesn't tell you what you ought to believe. It's now between you and the scriptures and God. And your con conscience is only bound to the scriptures and to God. And so it's that same idea that there's not going to be a rabbinic group or a Talmud at all that says this is what you must believe, you are now kind of left between you and God and others. And so uh, Reform Judaism has evolved, and there are congregations, for example, of Reform Judaism that uh, will ordain um, homosexual and transsexual uh, rabbis and so forth. So um, it's, again, that, that conscience thing. It's between you and God, right? Um, this, they were among the first, and we saw that in their ordaining of women to argue for the equal treatment of sexes. Again, Judaism has a long tradition while respecting women. They're not necessarily seen as the same. Uh, they're separate but different roles. And in Reformed Judaism, there's an egalitarianism about that. They're the same, all right? And a strong commitment in moral and social action, um, this belief in rebuilding the world, dikun alam, the idea that you are supposed to be rebuilding a broken world. You're supposed to be engaged through acts of 
charity, through social justice. You, that's kind of the enterprise and the meaning of the Jewish community. You're not supposed to withdraw. You're supposed to be a process of rebuilding. So uh, that'll give you a basic idea. Some flexibility on one hand, but still there's this desire to stay connected to God, to be in a community, to make religion. So there's still you still uh, celebrate some festivals. You maybe not won't do it in the same Orthodox tradition or as long, but you still do that. You still go to the synagogue. So a lot of differences, but there's still this desire to hang on to the religious side of your faith. It's no longer just a cultural thing, but and it's no longer a deep Orthodox thing with all these traditions, but there's this desire to merge your being in modernity with some sense of the religious side of your Judaism. And so that's Reformed Judaism. And as we saw, the majority of folks here in the United States, at least, are from that tradition. Then we want to talk about another group called Conservative Judaism, and this is kind of the middle of the road group. This is a group that wants, uh, they want to accommodate some to the modern culture, but hold on to more of the tradition. It's somewhere halfway between full-on Orthodox holding on to the tradition and this newfangled Reformed Judaism that's just uh, let go of too much. And so there's this middle of the road, road group um, called conservative Judaism. Again, there are many names I could pop in here, but uh, the one that's kind of given credit with conservative Judaism in America, at least, is this uh, Solomon Schechter. Uh, he kind of comes to fame. You remember a couple weeks ago, I talked about the Cairo Geniza, all these manuscripts that were found in the 18th century. He actually goes there, and he's one of the folks that gather that up and publish them and put them together and retrieved them for Cambridge University. So he kind of rose to fame in his scholarship for dealing with the documents that came out of that uh, Cairo Geniza. But then he comes to New York City in 1902, and he comes to oversee this new seminary that is trying to get the conservative movement off and running. And so uh, he comes, or he comes to that, and then... Um, there's some tensions there, and eventually he finds his own seminary there, United Synagogue of America. So what then is conservative Judaism? What does that look like? Well, again, it's this reaction to reform Judaism. It wants to allow some flexibility, but they feel that reformed Judaism allows too much flexibility. And known internationally as... Um, Masorti Judaism, so it's not just, especially in Israel, it's not, that's kind of the name for it outside of America, if you go to look it up. And so it's, again, I said that's that middle ground. So, and you can see I put a picture here, this mixed gender worship at the Great Wall in Jerusalem. Again, not a separation of men and women, they mix together and worship together. So uh, what are some of the tenets of conservative uh, Judaism. Well, again, I pull from one of the leaders of the conservative Judaism movement, and he lists the following uh, tenets. Uh, he would say, you begin with the centrality of modern Israel. These days, now we're moving into these days. The belief that um, we, we the, Israel is important. It is an important place to keep and cultivate the tradition of Judaism. So a belief in that. Uh, Hebrew. He, they're concerned about the, the disappearance of Hebrew. If we change everything into uh, the local languages, what is the, what is the thing that's going to keep us moored to our tradition and to our history? What's the language? And so this redoubling of the effort to make sure we're training our children in Hebrew and that we don't lose uh, this language. It doesn't disappear. Um, this, idea, this idea of a dedication to the land of Israel and the, and the people of Israel, the idea of Israel, that's there. The defining role of the Torah in reshaping Judaism. So we're not going to let go of the, the Torah. We're not going to um, uh, let it disappear. 
We're going to continue to understand it, study it, apply it to our lives. Halakha, the the law of the Torah, the law of tradition, that that still has an effective power in our life. And so uh, that's important. And it's nice to see that final, they too say we ought to believe in God. So let's not let go of that. That's It's still a, a, a theistic uh, faith. So again, this attempt to kind of draw this uh, line and tension between... Um, Time, this middle ground between Orthodox and Reformed Judaism. And then there's this additional kind of Judaism we'll talk about for a moment uh, called Reconstructionist. Now, this is an interesting type of Judaism. What, one of the things that begins to happen during all this enlightenment and all this change in modern world is that you start to have people realize that they're Jewish mostly because of their cultural background and the religious nature of their faith is disappearing. So if you no longer believe in God and you no longer believe in uh, the supernatural side of faith, if science has driven the supernatural out of your existence, can you still be Jewish? And so Reconstructionist Judaism tries to make a path for those who maybe they don't feel religiously Jewish anymore, rejecting of their spiritual background, to maybe now they, are, they can still identify. And the essence of Reconstructionist Judaism then becomes the tradition of Israel, the tradition and the story and maintaining your connection with the culture. So the kind of the founder of that group that's giving credit for it anyway, is uh, born in Lithuania, and he comes to New York City in 1889. Mordecai Kaplan is his, is his name. I love this story. He was ordained while on his honeymoon. Now, that's a dedicated dude right there. I try, if I tried to explain to my wife I had to take a break to get ordained, I'm sure I wouldn't be married to this day. That would not have worked. But he, he actually is ordained while he's on his honeymoon. Uh, he is really the first one to introduce this culture of bat mitzvah, this idea of instead of the bar mitzvah was for the young man when he becomes of age, he introduces the bat mitzvah for the daughters, and he does it for his daughter in 1922. So again, extending the culture. And uh, not surprisingly, because of his progressive views, he's actually executed, excommunicated by the Union of Orthodox Rabbis in 1945. So uh, most Jewish folks, is, folks would argue that Reconstruction, Reconstructionist Jewishness is not, or Judaism is not part of Judaism. It's a, outside the pale. It has left the building, according to most uh, Orthodox groups. But uh, obviously within J Reconstructionist Judaism, they feel, no, they're still a part of that. But again, they're culturally Jewish without being uh, religiously Jewish. So again, what is... What is that? What is that about? Well, uh, Mordecai Kaplan, uh, his, he comes up with this, uh, well, this is just kind of his book, his basic principles, the idea that he publishes this book, Judaism as a Civilization. And you can see the title gives the story away. That is what Judaism is in his uh, thinking. Uh, so he founds this society for the advancement of Judaism. Again, it's all about the promotion of this Reconstructionist. And what he does is he takes the, all the Passover Haggadah, that story, the prayer book, he takes that all out and he rewrites it in a way that's more, less supernatural, less uh, about God, more about just ethics and tradition and background. So it's, again, it's a cultural version um, in there. And uh, the first Reconstructionist, I think it's still in existence, but it was uh, Rabbinic College in, in Philadelphia, and I believe it's still there. So. so you have these different responses then to modernism, modern Jewish thought. You have this group over here, the Reform, that says, you know what, we're going to embrace the Haskalah, we're going to embrace the new world order, we're going to embrace the new world learning, and we're just going to learn to assimilate ourselves into culture. We're going to still hold on to our roots but we're, we're going to kind of make some adjustments. And then you have the conservatives that say, well, 
I think you're throwing a little bit, bit of baby and bat, out with the bathwater here, so we're going to keep a little bit more of our tradition here, the conservative group. We're going to still wear the yarmulke, for example. We're going to still believe in God. We're going to still have the Torah. We're going to still learn Hebrew. So it's a little more um, remembering of tradition. And you have Reconstructionists on the other side that say, you know what, we don't even sure we believe in God anymore, but we're going to keep up the cultural tradition. That's how we're going to be Jewish. And then, of course, you have the 30% over here that says, look, we may be Jewish culturally, but we're not even going to go to synagogue. We don't really even care about the religious side. I mean, we're not going to practice. We're just going to be. Maybe they'll go to synagogue once in a while. Maybe they'll do a Passover once in a while. But they're, it's, uh, you may know a few Roman Catholics like that or, a few, you know, that, or, or Baptists or anything that, that in name only. They're, they're, it's because of the tradition they're from, right? Well, in addition to all that, we have this whole movement. And this is, I didn't go into a lot of detail here because we could, we could go on in all kinds of ways. There's still this traditional element. Uh, Hasidism is one piece of Orthodox Judaism, but there are many other pieces. And I just took this quote from a scholar here that says, historically, there is no such thing as orthodoxy. In fact, you find the particular term is used primarily in North America. Uh, elsewhere, and this is true, you, you folks kind of, you're an observant, you're more observant or less observant. There's kind of continuum. How much are you observing Jewish tradition? It's on a continuum. But in North America, we just say orthodox. And the term orthodox Judaism is of rather recent origin, is used as a generic term to differentiate the movements following traditional practice from liberal Jewish movements. In other words, there's still a group of people, a smaller, you saw just, I think it was 6%, that said, you know what, we're just going to still, we're going to stick to the traditional worship service, the traditional dress. We're going to stick with the original rabbinic Torah interpretations as best we can. And as I said, some of that is whatever it is. I think it's like 200,000 or so um, Hasids in the U.S., so something to that effect. So those are the basic overall forms of Judaism that we have there. All right, I'm looking at the clock here, and I'm trying to decide whether I can get through the whole um, tenets of Zionism, and I don't think I'm going to be able to get through all of them, so I'm tempted to leave this on hold so that I can cover it in more depth next week. So I think we're going to stop here and pray, and then we have a few minutes for questions, and we'll call that the end of this talk. So let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll get into the questions. Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to reflect again on the history of your people. And uh, we are mindful of these tensions that we all face in our culture. How do we stay true from our roots to what we believe and still make sense of that culture in the here and now? And so, Father, we just hope that through our reflection on this other group that's had to work through those tensions that we might be informed about our own personal struggles and how to remain faithful to our source and yet be relevant and impactful in the world in which we live. And we ask this in Christ's name.